Good evening, my viewers. This is George On Deck with the latest edition of the George On Deck Show, or Get On Deck with George. I'm very proud tonight to have a fellow Petescalite with me, John Morbido, who's an author, and he's written nine books, John? Nine that are, actually eight are published, and one is going to the publisher. And you've so run, read, read, written one about the history of Peekskill. Well, that's in manuscript form. That's about the history of the streets of Peekskill, which is a very interesting um, education for me and also for the community. It's going to be dynamic. But i got to tell my viewers where I met John, and he's a local man like me. I met him in a new, unique place in Cortland Manor, right. which borders Peekskill. Is it called the Back Nine? It's the back nine is a golf. It's an indoor golf. A uh, virtual golf course, yes. Yeah, on a Wii thing, but it virtually does 40 different uh, golf, courses. golf courses. Yeah, it's quite a, it's a computerized golf, and it's good for the guys that have a passion to go there and swing, meet their buddies, have something to drink, something to eat. And there's a restaurant, a and bar there. a restaurant, a bar. It's a, it's a great place. But let's get back to being an author here now. Okay. Uh, Gee, we're all friends. We know all about Pete's Gill. You know more than me. I've only lived here 25 years. So there's a lot I still want to learn about the history of Pete's Gill. But let's hear about how you became an author, John. And what was your history before becoming an author? Well, I worked uh, for the state, and uh, I worked in a nuclear power plant with Indian Point, and then I worked in um, a project management for the company and did projects around the city and state. And uh, I left in 2004 with 29 years. Wow. And uh, had a friend of mine who continually said, you should write, uh -huh. write. And I said, you know, I'm not really a writer. I don't have the education and background for it. He says, but try it. And I did. And now I have eight published novels, one on the way, and I have already have a manuscript with a large volume of the history of the streets of Peekskill, which are so interesting because Peekskill has a lot of history. And there are a lot of people that don't realize how valuable this city was and this community was during the Revolution times. That's why it's been always known as a very patriotic city, Peekskill, New York. Very. Our hometown, the home of DeWitt Clinton, who was Dewitt Clinton? Well, Dewitt Clinton was, <laughs> he was an inventor too, I believe. He yeah. invented uh, a lot of things in this community. And along with him, I mean, the stove works, I think, were as valuable as everything we had to. Stove? Or the stove works, yes. Uh -huh. Many, many stove works. The plow works in Peekskill. Uh, the Southern Robertson. The, the, was there someone who was the Secretary of State of the state of New York named Clinton, or am I getting him mixed up with somebody else? I, I, be, get, is, I, don't, I don't know the or, Secretary or, of State. Or the. Uh, however, or, the, historically, there's Houston. Yeah. And. Uh, How about Georgie Pataki, our foreign oh governor? My Lord, uh, he's. Prominent, as prominent as Chauncey M. You know, right now they're putting up four new pieces of work of art down at the Riverfront Green at the cost of 75000 a piece or 300000 a grant from the state of New York. I think it would be something to put one up honoring our governor. I mean, he was a small-time boy, as you know, from... Uh, Pataki Farm. Maybe well, you want to tell us a little bit about Pataki Farm. Well, th that was always a, a great place, and his father, Louis, made some of yes. the finest, finest, he grew the finest vegetables. I didn't make any, he grew some of the finest vegetables. I always had a vegetable stand up in, uh, on uh, the Bear Mountain Extension there that people used to stop and go up and get their corn and fresh tomatoes. And he also was the assistant postmaster yes. for many years. And his son, what a success story. And George and his older brother, Louis, great, great George citizens. George started out as, I don't know what job he started first out as, but became mayor of Peetskill. Yale graduate. And 
governor of New York State. Mm -hmm. And I think last year he even made an attempt to run for president. He had the potential to do it, and still does probably. But we've got many prominent citizens of Peekskill over the years, right? Well, I think the person who stands out also is Chauncey M. Depew. Depew. And, and he was by far one of the greatest after-dinner speakers. Really? In February 19th, 1861, Lincoln came to town. I know that. I've been at a few of the... Uh, simulations of him getting off the train with our great Lincoln Society in Peekskill. And the person, Tell us a little bit about that, because you're a historian well, as well. Not as, not as much as a person like John Curran, uh, Frank Adair, these guys really know, but I've but done my study. John Curran, he is our current uh, historian. Yes. He's doing without, without we, pay from what I well, understand. Well, we need him. We need yes. John Curran. But I think the current administration should hire him back at a small stipend. I heard he was making 15000 or 12000 a year, which is nothing today. It's nothing. And, and, and there's a state regulation, I think. Every city has to have a historian. And I think they should bring him back at double that pay for, I, for the amount of work he used to do for the city of Pete. I'm with you on that, George. It's, John Curran is a historian. He always goes above the call of duty with that. And he's helped me so much, and he knows so much about this community. Uh, Chester Smith, William T. Horton, oh. Carlton Schofield, Franklin Couch, John Curran's right up there with these guys. And he knows all the history of that. He knows these guys. He knows now, who I'm talking about right now. Now, I want to know more about the area I moved in from Yonkers, New York, 25 years ago. And I want to be accepted as a Pete Skillite, but they said if I live here the rest of my life, I'll still be Yonkers. But I live in Society Hill, too, and I see streets up there named Beecher Lane and... Uh, and tell me a little bit about the history of that. Well, area. that was Henry Ward Beecher, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Yes, I've was, heard of her. Uh, was his sister. But now Harriet Beecher Stowe, Stowe was. Uh, she was a writer. She was yes, also a great very, writer. Very, yeah. What what novel and poet, did she write? And, uh, and Henry Ward Beecher also was a great speaker, along with Horace Greeley. Cassius M. Clay. New Year's Ago history. Cassius M. Clay, not the box of the, the No, but I think, I think this is where he got his name from. In 1849, yeah. this is something that just happened recently. I want to just want to bring this up while we're, we're yeah. on great speakers. In 1849, the first railway was completed, New York Central, yes. from, from Grand Central to Poughkeepsie. And the other section of it was from Grand Central to Croton Falls. They used to bring these speakers into Peekskill. And at the Presbyterian Church, they used to speak. And that was where the center was for these people to gather and listen to these great speakers. Where was this at now? The Presbyterian Church on the corner oh, of South. And it's still there, the white still, building, That right? big white building is still wow. there, George. And I and, understand and at Thanksgiving and Christmas they give out meals to the homeless and yeah. the downtrodden. And they're they're always great? doing something very nice. And Ray Blue always plays there. He's another person that goes down there. Oh, However, yes. the, this big fight started this one night when Cassius M. Clay came to speak. And the local people in the early 1850s wanted to speak about the abolishment of slavery in this area. Right. And he wanted to speak ab about something that he wrote called The World As It Is Now. Wow. And he spoke. He won out over them, and he spoke about his theme, The World As It Is Now, in that era. However, he vowed to come back and speak about slavery. Three months later, he come back. It was winter time, and he was four hours late. And when he got here, he complained about having to pay six dollars hmm. to jump on a hack. They called it to drive him here, 
And the reason that he was six, four hours late and had to pay six dollars was because the train that he was on crashed at oh. Spite and Dival. Yes, that just happened like, recently. Just like it happened recently. And history always when you mention that repeats her, itself. The New York Central, I have fond memories of New York Central. Oh my God. I was I, a boy in Yonkers and in the blizzard of nineteen forty seven my mother said to me, Daddy won't be home for about a week. I says, Why, Mom? He worked as a laborer on the New York Central, putting track down, because he had to quit school when he was 18, because my grandfather died, and he helped my grandmother support seven children. Wow. And he was one of the guys responsible for these speakers to be able to come up to Peekskill, and I'm very proud of my father to this day. But when you said the New York Central, that jogged my memory, uh, and he worked in the Croton Harmon Roundhouse. And for a week, he had to shovel the snow off the stations. They didn't have automatic things then. Yeah. And uh, I guess off the tracks, too. It was all hard labor in them days. But uh, let's get back to the history of Pete Skill. And we have to get on to your nine, eight or nine books. I'll, I'll start all right, with let's get on here. to them books. Here's the first book I wrote. And what this was, is what? called The Lower Farm. The Lower and Farm. And it starts in San Francisco and ends up in outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's about a character that's looking for his particular freedom in an era where it was a lot of anti this, anti that, and a rebellion against the war that nobody wanted. It takes place in the 60s. It's and against the Vietnam War? It's the Vietnam War. Do you know I'm a Vietnam vet? Oh, well, I am too. Have you? you are. And so is this character in this book. Welcome home, brother. <laughs> and thank right. you for your service. Are you really a Vietnam vet? Oh, well, sure I Where'd am. you serve? U.S. 51560141. I served stateside, but I was in the era. You were in the Vietnam era? I was in era. the first draft of the Vietnam era. I was in a draft when I was 24 and a half mm -hmm. years old you at were Yonkers, an old -timer New then. York. <laughs> yeah. Married two years mm -hmm. and went to play coup Vietnam. Wow. And survived two rocket attacks, direct hits on my field hospital. The second one I was injured and medevac back to the States. You and one of the places we stopped was San Francisco. Well, that's where this story starts. Well, and this character, it. I lived out west for a okay. while, yep. Yeah. And this character ends up outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, in a place called the Lower Farm. The Lower Farm. A year later, there's the sequel to that story. It starts in San Francisco again, and it goes to the northern part of California in the middle of the Mendocino National Forest. And that's where that story takes place. Those were your first two books. Huh? The first two there. John, this story, i got to ask you, what made you stop and become a writer? You were a nuclear plant. What was the title again? Uh, I started out as a mechanic. And, ga and gas, a mechanic. gas plant. Well, mechanic. that was in the, uh, the project management days. However, this book here, Troop, Troop One. One. Troop One was the oldest Boy Scout troop in America right here in Pisco. Wow. It Boy was. Boy Scout. Huh? Yeah, Boy Scout mm. troop. So I wrote this particular story using that troop, and it's about a young boy who listened to his father and his uncle talk about the war, the Second World War that they were in. Mm. And it he was 12 years We were years very old. patriotic during that war, I understand, <laughs> that people saluted the guys and kissed them on 42nd Street when the yeah, troops oh, came. Oh, sure. We loved Not our, like what happened to us Vietnam vets, no, they, right? Uh, they spit on us they and they told us to take our uniforms off so people wouldn't know we were soldiers. Because people like Jane Fonda real, ruled the airwaves and the hippies who were against the war. Right. It was, uh, they were kicking a lot of sand. Yep, you're yep, right. Yep. However, this particular story yes. is about a young boy who joins the Boy Scouts because he wants to wear that uniform. Uh -huh. has a horrible experience in the Boy Scouts and vows never to wear a uniform again and gets rebellious, drops out of school and gets involved in all the wrong things and with all the wrong people in the middle of Harlem and meets a fine young lady and this young lady says, you have to stop what you're doing. He says, one more deal. And that one more deal he got caught 
And in them days, they had an option whether to go to jail or go in the military. He opted to go into the military, only to end up in Vietnam with the big red one back on his arm again. I was attached to the 4th Division, 71st Medevac Hospital, Central Highlands. I don't know how close you were to me. During the Tet Offensive, which was the hottest I never left the, the States, but my brother okay. did. He was so a... you heard about it. Yes, and my brother was an airborne medic. And he's a Purple Heart recipient. I was a medic, uh -huh. but I couldn't do my duties because I was injured in the States originally. Had a bed, very bad fracture of my left ankle with a pin in place. Man, oh, man. In spite of that, the service was so desperate to send people to Vietnam, they told me they were save, sending me to a safe place, a medevac hospital in the field right in the middle of all the action. Like you a know mash, cent, like you, a mash type yeah, you know tent. The, yeah. You know the Central Highlands. Yeah. Um, this particular book here yeah. is the foreman. the foreman. This actually starts at Indian Point. It does. It's about a character Con from... Edison, India, and it's entity in Indian point. And this particular guy is a foreman in the plant and ends up foreman on a jury in Manhattan. Wow, that should be interesting. And a lot of intrigue. And, uh, John, I have to stop you halfway through your books, but we're going to cover them all. I have a bucket list. I always wanted to be a writer. What would it take for me to sit down and write a book? Could I do it? Well, you're a great speaker, George. Thank you. And everything that comes out of your mouth, just put it on paper. Really? But how do you know a beginning, an end, a middle? Uh, is there a, uh, do you, you don't have to take a formal journalism course or go to college? Well, it would probably this? help. But there's a yeah. lot and of my, great. And you know, at my courses. young age, 71 going on to 72, I am ap applying right now to vocational rehabilitation because I am a disabled vet, to go back to school to take print journalism and broadcast journalism. I feel my life is just beginning, well, and gotta, other people our age feel it's all over. Uh, you got to keep your eye on that prize, and you'll be rewarded heavily with all of what you And I'm going to recommend a create. book while I'm recommending your book, Four Doors. I don't know what the author is, who the author is. I heard it on Casey Morbido's show uh -huh. a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m., and it more or less says, if you want to do something, go out and do it. Don't hold back. Don't say you can't do it, because the only way you can't do something is if you don't do it. If you don't at least try, you can't do it. You said, I'm going to write a book, and you've read, written eight or nine. <laughs> nine. Eight published and This one fellow who wrote this book, Four Doors, he's written 27 books. And he's had the number one bestseller every time he's written a book. What? And I wish that for you on your <laughs> well, next book. That's a real book. nice wish. I, uh, and tell I, me one more thing before you go on to your other books. Yeah. Where can people obtain your books if they would still like to? Well, there's a website that you can go on. What's my the website? website? JohnJMorbido.com. Uh -huh. There's Barnes & Noble. Uh -huh. There's well, the library. Okay. But we the don't want to be has some doing of our any thing commercialism now, but that's how they could get your books yeah. if they want to read them, okay? Sure. Barnes & Noble lets you read them without even buying them. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, and the but, library has But maybe too. that gets you interested in a book, and so it's good right. philosophy. But what's your fourth book now? My fourth book is a historical fiction called Dogtown Days. Dogtown Days. Dogtown Days is about Peekskill, an area of Peekskill, and an era of Peekskill that's long gone. It's about some characters that were real flamboyant in that era. Wow, I'd like to read that. They were that stock book. car drivers, and they raced right where the A&P shopping center is. That used to be. You mean where, where uh, McDonald's is? And everything? Exactly. Yeah. Before it was a one-fifth of a mile oval, it was a ballpark. And the, and the Peekskill Highlanders used to play ball there. They were a triple-A team. Right. And the triple-A team usually had an opportunity 
to be pulled from the New York Giants. Didn't John Mayer do something with bringing him back to Pizza last winter? I, I think he, he did. Yes, he did. And I got I had him on my show, by the way. He's a great, great guy. He is. But this story is a lot of fun. It has a lot of history Dogtown of the area. Dogtown Days. And that was the name of that area, Dogtown. And it is, brings back a feeling of what it was like in that era. That's what it does for me when I wrote it. That's what I wanted it to do. And based on the reaction of the, the community, they did it for them too. Mm -hmm. um, this book here happens in Peace School too, and it Uriah. ends up. Yeah, it's a. Uriah Hill, there's a school named after Yeah, that. Uriah Hill Jr. was the person. It's spelled a little different though. Mm -hmm. This particular story is about a 13 year old boy who hears about a golf course in the area, mm -hmm. and his life changes based on wow. his little excursion to the golf course, and the characters in this book are from this area, and the story starts in Pisco. Hmm. So it's another story that I feel is a lot of fun for people to read and have an opportunity to bring back memories of this area. This is a two-in-one book. The Justice Club, if you turn it over, it's called White Deer, Black Bear. This particular story is about an 83-year-old man whose passion was to hunt. And what? for the 65 years of hunting, he got a buck every year in his sanctuary in the forest. But this one particular year that he goes there at 83 years old, he hears this rustling and a 350-pound black bear charges him, and all hell breaks loose, and he drags this thing out of the forest. The Justice Club... He drags the bear out of the yeah, forest, or did the bear drag him no, out for, he, for killing all those deer all them years? Well, the man had a passion, and that was yes, one hunting. that he loved. Did he do it for eating purposes? Oh, Martin? sure. He didn't do it just to put the antlers up on the Well, <coughs> that was the prize, too. He had, to, I know. he had to have the ego for that, too. You don't know this, but I'm very anti-hunting, but we're not going to talk I about I never that. shot anything either, George. I couldn't even kill a flea, you know <laughs> that. And they sent me to Vietnam to kill people. <laughs> I know. But we were trained to do that, but I know. it would be a hard thing to do. Yep. However, this story here, The Justice Club, takes place in Manhattan. It's about three retired New York City detectives who all have cancer and meet oh, in a chemotherapy center. Wow. And each one of them befriends each one of them, and they find they have one thing in common, and they hated the way the justice system worked against them during their careers and decide to take the law in their own hands. Wow. A lot of fun reading that story. Okay. So what's coming out, uh, hopefully by May, it's called Felony Hill, my new book. Felony Hill. Uh, Felony Hill is a takeoff on Capitol Hill. Oh. With a couple <laughs> really. <laughs> that ought to be interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting and easy to write about because we have so much scandals and scams going on. Mm. And I got a couple politicians that I wrote about, I created. Did they remain nameless? Uh, well, they have their own they names. They could be based on it's, someone. You could, you could put a, in Congress, a, a picture are you saying? In, right in, the, in well, our... I look uh, forward to reading that. You know why? I've been interested in politics ever since the day a whistle stop in Yonkers, my old hometown, when my daddy took me to see Harry Truman and his daughter Margaret. They did a whistle stop like Lincoln did in Peekskill. And a few years later, I saw uh, Mr. John F. Kennedy and was able to shake hands with him and got, and got my picture in the Herald Statesman newspaper shaking hands with a president. And in that days, you could go up to a president. Isn't it a shame today, the security? That well, you're not going to have that. But you've been blessed, George, with a lot of great opportunities and yes. to have the show here like this is a And a wonderful wife, Gail Blessing on deck that I've been married to for 50 years this weekend. What a and life. our mayor, Frank Catalina, came by to our little party and gave us a proclamation. Isn't that something? Well, he's a, 
He's dynamic and he's going to do a lot for this city. But let me ask you something about patriotism. I'm starting to wonder what's happened to patriotism in the patriotic city of Pitsko. And I'm going to give you two quick examples. This American flag. We have a historic building, City Hall in Pitsko. And I would like anybody who's watching this show to call City Hall on this issue. We have a flagpole on top of the building, and the flag is not being displayed there. I've been giving various excuses over the last year or so why it can't be done. What is your feeling, on? Well, you hit on a really good subject, something that I've been thinking about for a long time because I really read up on the American flag, and especially for Peekskill. The flag in our community in Peekskill should be taken to the highest level that it possibly could take into because that's where the first American flag was put together, right in back of the municipal building Are you in kidding Peace me? School on Nelson Avenue. When the British came here, they they um, anchored their, their ship at the base of Main Street. They come up that dusty road, and they camped right in back of where the municipal building is now. The Patriots heard about this. The Continentals heard about it, and it was a big skirmish there. They had fights chased the British out of there. They got on their ship and they left. They left a big blue cloak, a British cloak. The Continentals cut that cloak, a big piece out of it. They took munition shirts that they were wearing and made white stripes and took some red material and made the red and made that flag and put it on a post and that night they flew it at Fort Stanwix. That was right in Peekskill. Wow. So the mayor and the council should know this. Well, they will know and that there if shouldn't they... shouldn't be any excuses why they... They should... I'm not blaming the current mayor, but I asked at least five times over the last year the former mayor and council, and it's still controlled four to three by one political party. And they're Amazing. giving the new mayor and the two new councilmen, Republicans, by the way, excuses on why it can't be done or why it has to be delayed until an engineer engineers something. Men at Iwo Jima died their red blood for the red in this flag, and they're giving excuses why it can't be done. Isn't that a shame? That's, that is a shame. And, uh, and John, very quickly ending this show, I'm rushing off after I meet you tonight because Governor Cuomo and the state legislator passed a, a property school tax um, exemption for veterans, and the Peatskill Board of Ed is dragging their feet on. Isn't that a shame? Well, it is a shame, and the, the veterans have to be recognized a little bit more. It's, but it's John, sad. You've been such an interesting guest tonight. We didn't even get around to talking about the history of Peatskill, which I really wanted. Will you promise to come back again about a month there from now and do I another can. show with me? I can, George. What would you like to say in, to my vast audience in closing? Well, I think that everybody that comes on this show has something to offer. And my whole thing is that I think George gives back something to this community by bringing people on. And I sure want to give something back to the community by writing this book about the history of the streets John, of Peace I've been Guild. doing this for 17 years without the benefit of pay because I really like people. I like getting the word out to people on various subjects. And my audience, I've presented John Morbido, author uh, extraordinaire from <laughs> Peekskill, New York, my hometown. Until next time, as Red Skelton used to say, God bless, and God bless America and this flag, amen.